Uh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes ma'am. Uh, can you keep the slide? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. So yes. We can see. Is that good? Okay. Um, one more thing here. Where did the chat go? There we go. I was just going to open that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, let me, I think I have to, there we go. Okay, so this is just an outline of my talk and I wanna start by introducing my organization and how I got involved in edible insects. And since this is day three of the conference, I'm sure you're all very well versed on the benefits of edible insects. So I'm just gonna to touch upon the main themes here and then really get into the meat of my presentation, which is edible insects and livelihoods. And my experience in this field is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and I'm going to be referring to it as the DRC. Um, so my talk is really focused on livelihood prospects for vulnerable groups of people in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm gonna to touch upon both wild insects and farmed insects and the advantages and challenges of each, how we can add value to edible insects and insect-based products, and of course the many revenue generating activities that have come out of the sector. And throughout my talk I'm going to present case studies from the literature as well as from my own experience. So I really hope this talk gets you thinking and inspires you to get involved in the sector if you aren't already. So a little bit about me. I'm a veterinarian and a beekeeper from Colorado. And here in Colorado, I have um, a honeybee veterinary medicine practice. I am also a mommy to three, a 10 year old, an eight year old and a seven year old. And I am founder of the nonprofit organization Farms for Orphans. And as um, was said in the introduction, two of my kids are from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And it was through the adoption process that I saw firsthand the poor nutritional status of kids and particularly orphans in this country and just the impoverished conditions that these kids exist under. It's not at all uncommon for orphanage kids to receive one meal a day and go for several weeks with very little to no protein in their diet. In fact, there's over 10 million kids that are either chronically or acutely malnourished. 43% of kids under the age of five are stunted and micronutrient deficiencies are pervasive. There was a study that was published in 2017 about the cost of hunger in Africa, and the authors reported that the cost of child malnutrition in the DRC is 1.7 billion USD annually. So it's a significant burden to the country's economy. And it was knowing these statistics and watching my own kids grow and thrive with good nutrition is what moved me to do something for other orphaned and vulnerable kids in the country. And so I founded the nonprofit organization Farms for Orphans with the aim of helping orphanages grow their own protein and nutrient rich food. And as a veterinarian, I plan to do this through small scale livestock production, but quickly learned that most orphanages in Kinshasa, which is where we work, um, have no land and they're literally surrounded on all sides by concrete. So there's really no option for them to grow a garden or to raise livestock. And it was in my research, I came across an article about insect consumption in the DRC and it just completely blew my mind. I really, previous to this, had no idea that insects were such a popular food in the country. And the more I learned, the more I became convinced that farming insects and in orphanages could help alleviate food insecurity and empower them, um, as well as the youth economically through the sale of insects and insect-based products. So we're currently focused on farming palm weevil larvae and 
the larva is, it's a grub really, it's a beetle grub, and it's a very popular food insect throughout the Congo Basin. And we also are working to develop techniques to, mar to farm additional insects. All right, everybody disappeared. Are you still there? Yes, still here. We are here. So because okay, of the internet, good. we just off the. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, still there. Okay. Yeah, All right. I just wanted to make yeah, sure yeah. I was still uh, speaking to somebody out there. Okay. <laughs> it's there. So I. <laughs> I traveled to Kinshasa, which is the capital city of the Congo, and this is where our operations are based. I, I go there several times a year, and I always look forward to eating insects while I'm there, and it's a completely different experience than here in the U.S. I mean, in the U.S., they're, they're typically dried and seasoned, and there's not a lot of variety, and they all kind of taste the same, but in the Congo, there is a huge selection of insects to choose from and they're fresh and they're meaty and they're prepared in many, many different ways. So I would like to know from you all, you can type in the chat, how many people on this call eat insects regularly? And whether or not you eat them regularly, I'm wondering how many different insect species you've tried. So I have my chat open and I can uh, okay. look to see. Yeah, uh, ma'am, personally, I haven't tried, I haven't tried only one, but uh, in my research, I've documented and collected more than 80 species, particularly from one state, my state, that is Manipur, Northeast India. I, I can type it here. From 80, more than, more than, 80 species in Manipur, North East India. Do other Nightless. people in the audience eat insects? Yeah. Occasionally? Many, uh, yes. so yes, um, yes, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, yeah. I have eaten, yes, yeah. yes, many, yes. ma'am. Yeah, I have eaten termites, my color. termites, uh, fried and roasted termites. It is a seasonally during the rainy season, it used to outbreak. So, oh, I have eaten the termites, ma'am. Is it automatic? termites are one of my favorites too, ma'am? Do you? Uh, uh, I uh, tested giant water bug. Giant water oh, bug. Oh, yes. I have not tried giant water bugs, but those are <laughs> apparently very popular, I know, in Thailand and in Southeast Asia. So um, these photos here I took yeah, at the yeah, hotel yeah. where I typically stay, and they regularly have insects in their breakfast buffet. And it was on this particular trip. I had been there three days and there were no insects in the buffet. So I, I finally asked the chef what was going on. And he laughed and said that the staff had actually been eating all of them. So they never made it out to the buffet, but he promised to set some aside for me. And um, every morning, this is what he cooks for me. It's palm weevil larva with scrambled eggs and vegetables. And it's absolutely delicious. And one of my favorite things to do in Kinshasa is go to the markets and edible insects are everywhere. So this video shows some of the more popular insects that are sold. And of the 24 or so extant insect orders, five insect orders have been clearly preferred as a food source throughout time. And four of those are represented here. All I'm missing in this video is a representative from the order Hymenoptera, the bees, wasps, and ants. But um, those are also eaten in the Congo. I just didn't happen to get them in this video clip. Okay, so um, insects are consumed by billions of people in many different countries. And you, as you can see from the map, entomophagy 
tends to be concentrated in the tropical and subtropical regions where there's a larger diversity of insects. Um, they're larger bodied, they're a lot more suitable for eating, and they also have a longer window of availability. Um, you can see Mexico, Brazil, the Congo, China, it looks like India as well, and of course Thailand are very active in entomophagy, and there are a wide variety of insect species consumed in these countries. But what I really appreciate about them is how nutrient dense they are. And of course, their nutritional composition does vary depending on the life stage that's consumed, the insect's habitat and diet, as well as any processing or cooking, which can either enhance or decrease their nutritional value. But for species for which there's data, um, it shows that uh, many of them are very rich sources of protein, fat, and micronutrients. Farms for Orphans ran a nutritional analysis on our farmed palm weevil larva, as well as some wild harvested larva from, that we purchased from the market. And we found that they had almost identical nutritional profiles. Although our farmed larva were significantly higher in fat, most likely because of the diet that we're rearing them on. But they're excellent sources of protein and micronutrients. A 100 gram serving, which is probably about like 12 to 14 larva, contains 26 grams of protein, seven and a half grams of iron, and 103 milligrams of calcium. Um, I have the whole nutritional profile on our website if you guys wanted to check that out. But you can see that they can play a significant role in improving nutrition and food security. But having said that, they are by no means a poor man's food. In fact, where entomophagy is practiced, um, a lot of the times they're eaten for their taste. And in many instances, including the Congo, um, they're considered a delicacy. So most insects that are consumed are harvested from the wild, but insect farming for food and animal feed, feed is gaining a lot more attention in recent years. And when considering the environmental benefits, insect farming can be much more efficient than traditional livestock production. And some of the major advantages of insect farming compared to livestock production that have been suggested are that insect farming requires less land and less water use. They produce lower amounts of greenhouse gas emissions and environmental pollutants such as ammonia, which can lead to things like acid rain and acidification of ecosystems. Um, they're more efficient at converting feed to meat. So for example, 45 kilograms of feed produces 4.5 kilograms of beef, while the same amount of feed yields 20 kilograms of crickets. And then insects can also transform low value organic byproducts into a high quality food or feed. And although insects are typically collected from rural areas, there's many opportunities to become engaged in the insect sector in both rural and urban landscapes. So for example, rural populations can be involved in the collection and farming of insects for consumption or for sale. And urban populations can be involved in the processing, marketing, and sale of wild harvested insects in urban markets. And they can also more easily participate in more regional, in the more regional and international sale of insects. And insect farming isn't confined to rural areas because they can be farmed indoors using a vertical farming strategy. Urban populations can also become involved in insect farming. So the collection, processing, marketing, and sale of forest products, including edible insects, are activities that are generally carried out by women and indigenous people, providing them with important livelihood opportunities. One study that I read um, reported that over 94% of the non-timber forest product traders, um, these were surveyed in Cameroon, were women. These are typically small and medium scale enterprises. Um, for these groups, gaining equitable asset access, excuse me, to essential resources like credits, inputs, technology, training and business and marketing, et cetera, those are lacking for these demographics. But we know 
that empowering and investing in women can increase productivity, improve livelihoods, and reduce hunger and malnutrition. I've already mentioned the word livelihood multiple times, and I think we all have a general understanding of what this means. A person's livelihood refers to their means of securing the basic necessities of life, such as food, water, fodder, medicine, shelter, and clothing. And there are many ways these ba basic necessities can be acquired you know, through harvesting and growing their own food and medicine, building shelter using natural resources, through trading goods and services, and through obtaining gainful employment that will allow one to purchase these basic necessities. So I wanna make two points here. First, we must think about livelihoods in terms of making a living wage. So having an income doesn't necessarily mean you're able to secure your basic necessities. On the other hand, a living wage is defined as the minimum income necessary for a worker to meet his or her basic needs. And second, people should have the ability to earn a living wage safely and with dignity. They should be provided all the training tools and resources that, that they need so they can effectively perform their job. So this is a, a photo of a palm weevil harvest in Cameroon. These men have no safety equipment. They're working in the forest in flip-flops. I think that one guy is actually barefoot and they're using very, very basic tools. And it also appears that this might not be a very environmentally sustainable practice, which brings me to my last point, or my next point rather, is that we need to think about livelihoods in terms of sustainability. And I'm sure you've all heard of the sustainable development goals. These are 17 goals adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015. And they're a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure all people enjoy peace and prosperity by the year 2030. So this means that all people have the ability to provide for themselves in such a manner that's, that's viable in the long term while maintaining the healthy functioning of the Earth's ecosystems. So this talk is really about green livelihoods. And green livelihoods allow people to obtain the necessities of life while ensuring that the natural assets that they rely on continue to provide the resources and environmental services on which our well being relies. And I really believe that edible insects have great potential for providing people green livelihoods. And I would argue that edible insects can help address multiple sustainable development goals from no poverty, zero hunger, um, gender equality, climate action, life on land, um, a, a lot of them. So I'd like to introduce you to Dorcas and She's one of Farms for Orphans beneficiaries. I first met her in 2017. She resided at an orphanage where we had built one of our first palm weevil farms. And at the time she was 19 years old. So she was old enough to move out of the orphanage, but she was unemployed and had no means to support herself. And Dorcas is not unique in this regard. In fact, unemployment among Congolese youth is estimated to be above 70%. I mean, that's just staggering. But she showed a really keen interest in farming palm weevil and asked if we could train her so that she could start her own business. And this is when the idea to begin training cooperatives of vulnerable women and youth to farm insects took hold. And of course, you know, farmer cooperatives are not a new thing. Um, it, was, it was new for me at the time. And the formation of these cooperatives by those involved in the edible insect sector, whether they're gatherers or farmers, I think will be a really powerful tool in the development of the sector in Africa. These cooperatives can work together to reduce their costs. They can pull resources and skills, lower transaction and transportation costs, and have improved access to training credit and to markets. And cooperatives allow the stakeholders to work together to further their common agenda, strengthen recognition for their activities, increase their, and increase their bargaining power. And this is key. They can aid in the planning, 
design and implementation of policies and programs that affect their livelihoods. And the benefits for co-op members are obvious. They have increased food production, increased food security, and decreased poverty. So in a nutshell, improved livelihood prospects. So what do you guys think? What are the most challenging elements of reaching these, the targeted women and youth and providing the services listed here? And how do we overcome these barriers? Um, I'm just gonna leave that as food for thought so that I can uh, keep going and make sure I stay on time. Uh, so the edible insect breed, sorry? No, actually, uh, we also face a problem. The acceptance is very, uh, this one, difficulty challenges for us. Though these edible insects consume uh, a specific ethnicity, but white, making white acceptance is a challenge for us. And um, uh, to raise interest among the farmers to, to rear the edible insect is also a challenge because whatever they're eating, whatever we are eating, these are all collected from the natural sources. Okay. And so that people are in general hesitant um, to become involved in the sector because it's looked upon poorly. Is, is that the problem? Uh, technology is also not there. Uh, means uh, we need to train them and it is easy, readily available. So mm -hmm. that may be the point. So we have started as in uh, means means of livelihood earning. So my, uh, this is my, uh, this one vision to start and to prop, uh, this one to promote, to, um, to adopt as a livelihood opportunities. Though we are eating from the long time, but to make as a livelihood, uh, this one, still it is lacking behind and it is available in the market too. But these are all collecting from the, during the season from the natures and selling to the market in the local market, not in the commercial means in a, not in a wider scale, it is still not yet adopted in India. Gotcha, okay. And, um, well, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages of, of the wild harvested sector as well as the, the farming sector. And some of the advantages of the edible insect trade in Africa, um, whether they're, most of them are um, harvested from forests and farmlands. And I guess one of the first advantages is that it really requires very few resources or tools to collect the insects. So this is really an activity that anybody can participate in. And a lot of the time it's women and youth and indigenous people. And of course, this is going to contribute to their food security and household income. And coming back to green livelihoods, the survival of this sector is really dependent on the conservation of insects and their habitat. So this is really kind of a future advantage that I see is that with more awareness for the critical role of wild harvested insects in securing livelihoods will or really should lead to more rigorous management and protection of these natural resources. And in doing so, the integration of ind indigenous knowledge I think is gonna be essential because forest managers really have very little knowledge or appreciation of the potential for managing and harvesting wild insects sustainably. But on the other hand, forest dependent people really have a remarkable um, skill set and knowledge of the insects and their management. And these are the people that really need to play a key role in developing legislation for sustainable collection of wild harvested insects. And this all sounds very promising, which it is, but there are challenges. There are many, many challenges that need to be addressed. Um, the lack of basic hygiene measures and food safety standards is a problem for most retailers selling in African markets. And it really prevents them from reaching a greater diversity of consumers. You know, insects are free ranging organisms. So there's really no control over their environment and the type of materials they feed on. So the presence of pesticide residues, heavy metals, even pathogenic microorganisms 
in, in insects and insect derived products is, is a public health concern. Now, for most edible insects, only a certain life stage is consumed. So collection and sale of wild harvested insects is really a seasonal activity and not a full-time venture. And then insect harvest, harvest can be variable from season to season and year to year. And this can be due to just natural population level fluctuations, fluctuations due to environmental variability, um, climate change leading to drought and severe weather events could certainly be affecting insect populations. Deforestation is also affecting harvests. In the Congo Basin, forest land is being cleared uh, mostly for subsistence agriculture and firewood at just an alarming rate. So obviously this is having an effect on the abundance of forest dwelling species. And then over harvesting is certainly a concern. Um, there's very little to no regulation regarding the collection of any non-timber forest products and many species of plant and animal are suffering from population declines um, due to over harvesting. And then again, not all wild harvesting techniques like the, the palm weevil harvest here in Cameroon is environmentally friendly or sustainable. And I'm gonna talk about that a little more um, later. Again, there's just a lack of a any kind of regulatory framework around this. And this really needs to change. The, the human population is only increasing and the continued wild harvest of forest foods for a burgeoning human population is, is just not sustainable. Oh, sorry. And then my last point on there was that insect trade in the global south takes place in informal markets, meaning that workers are self-employed or they work for others who are self-employed. And many informal workers do their business in unprotected and unsecure places. And in this day and age, I feel all people really should have the opportunity to learn a living under safe and healthy working conditions. And they really need to be provided protections against sickness, disease, and injury arising out of their employment. So that's certainly something else that needs to be addressed. So I mapped out some of the possible revenue streams stemming from wild harvested insects so you can get a visual. Collectors, they can harvest for household consumption use and, and some may sell all of their harvest, but the vast majority are somewhere in the middle where they keep a portion for household consumption and then they sell or trade surplus yields at local markets. So they can sell to local markets, local restaurants or grocers, to wholesale buyers. And if transportation is feasible, they can sell directly to consumers in urban markets. Insects that are sold at markets for, can first be processed and packaged to increase their shelf life. This typically involves degutting the insect, boiling, um, drying them in the sun or over ashes or in an oven. Um, some people preserve them with salt after boiling them. That's very common, but I think it tastes pretty gross. Not, not a, a big fan of salted insects. Um, they can also be cooked and sold as a street food, or they can be sold live and fresh, which is how the majority of them are sold in African markets. Wild harvested insects and insect products are also commonly sold for medicinal purposes. Um, and the DRC termites, for example, are used to treat stomach ache in children. I haven't tried it yet, so I, I don't know if that really works, but um, that's what I hear. Middlemen and wholesalers sell to retailers operating in distant markets, restaurants and grocers, and then possibly through regional and international channels. And then similar to rural markets, they can be sold as a food as well as for medicinal or other, other purposes. So the final price once they reach urban markets is really dictated by the number of middlemen involved, the cost of travel to get from where they're collected to the end consumer, 
as well as the season. So during the low season, when insects aren't as abundant, the price is typically higher. So insect prices can really vary between rural and urban areas. The selling rate can vary from one locality to another and from one, from one region to another within a country, but regardless of where the market is located, whether the insects are sold live and fresh versus cleaned and processed makes a big difference in the final price and therefore the revenue that can be generated. For example, in Kenya, uncleaned termites were sold in an equivalent of 22 to 94 cents per keg. Um, by the way, all of the, the prices and monetary values that I'm presenting here are in US dollars. And so whereas clean termites, these have a, a much higher level of food safety control and they're recommended by the government agencies. These ones sell for $1.30 per keg. And similarly in Tanzania, a buyer will pay 66 cents per keg for fresh grasshoppers and $1.83 per keg for fried ones with their wings, appendages and ovipositor removed. So there's a lot of value added with basic processing and there's a huge need for training and support in this area. I conducted a series of interviews with Sam, who is the founder of Entomo Food Africa for this, this first case study here that I'm presenting. And Entomo Food Africa is one it might actually be the only licensed business in the DRC that specializes in the sale of wild harvested edible insects. They're based in Lumbabashi. It's located uh, way far down in the southern part of the country. It's close to Zambia. And they support 15 female insect collectors. They also have three full-time employees and five, five part-time employees. Um, and their employees make pretty good money considering that the average annual income in the DRC is just $540 USD per year. Entomo Food purchases insects from a cooperative of 15 women collectors. Um, these women are based in Lualaba province. It's uh, Northwest of Lumbabashi. The women are all married except for one widow all are mothers, they have anywhere from one to seven children and all make a year round living through agriculture. The women collect insects for Entomo Food Africa from November to April. And this is when they harvest termites, caterpillars, beetles and beetle larvae. And the insects they collect are on land that are owned by their community. So the only permission that is needed is from their village chief. The average income for insect collection for these women is $100 per month or about $600 per season. And the income from collecting insects goes toward food, medicine, basic necessities, as well as school fees for their children. This is an example of the cost and profits for caterpillars. Sam purchases the caterpillars from the women's cooperative for $10 per keg. The cost to transport the caterpillars from where they were harvested to Entomo Foods facilities is about $1 per keg. Then the insects are cleaned, they're frozen, boiled with a little salt, and then they're dehydrated using an electric dehydrator. And then they're finally packaged. And this costs them about $2.50 per keg. And then the packaged caterpillars are sold for $17 per keg. And that it, that's the local price and they're sold for $25 per keg um, internationally. So the net profits are about $3.50 per package of insects locally and $11.50 for international sales. This is a price list for their products. They do sell whole live insects, but really their claim to fame are their processed and packaged insects as well as their insect flowers. They also sell freshly cooked, ready to eat insects. Um, they have these locusts and caterpillar skewers and they also sell a variety of pastries that they make from their insect flour. 
Sam told me that they follow all health and hygiene standards recommended by the local authorities. And they also work with the state lab and um, the English translation, it's the Agro Elementary Research Center. And the, all of their samples are analyzed to determine their nutritional value. And they also check hygiene and health standards of the products before they're placed on the market. He said that they do test them for pesticides. As far as marketing, Entomo Foods participates in a number of local fairs and exhibitions. They sell every Saturday at their local market. And then they also have a Facebook page. So you guys can get on Facebook and check out all of their products on there as well. And all of their information is on there um, with their prices and how to contact them. You can see their display is clean. Their workers are dressed very nicely. The insects are presented in colorful packaging. Their primary consumers are obviously from large urban centers within the Congo. Um, first and foremost, uh, most of their consumers are in Lumabashi where they're located. Uh, second, Kulwezi, that's the capital city of Lualaba province where the women's insect harvesting co-op are located. And then third in Kinshasa. Um, most of the international sales are to France, Belgium, and the USA. Um, they sell a lot to edible insect supply companies as well as to the diaspora living in those countries. The local consumers purchase fresh or dried insects uh, primarily for home consumption. And the two most popular are locust and caterpillar followed by crickets and termites. European customers purchase primarily for a feed ingredient, the most popular being termites. And then US customers also purchase um, primarily for food and the most popular are termites and locust. Sam says, that they sell about 10 kegs per species per month. And again, net profits are about 20% for local sales and 40% for international sales. That's a picture of Sam there with his big container of locusts. So Sam said that they're experiencing growth every single year and demand is much greater than their supply. Obtaining a steady supply of wild harvested insects is, is getting more challenging because wild populations are decreasing. Uh, one species in particular that they're receiving less and less of is the rhinoceros beetle. So because they can't rely on these wild harvested insects, Sam wants to begin farming several species to supplement their supply. So there is tremendous opportunity here. Um, and this is your call to action. What are some things you can do? I, I hope this inspires you. Support and partner with organizations working in Africa to scale operations. Help brainstorm. What are some more sustainable and innovative means of obtaining a reliable supply? So Entomo Food Africa's competitors are other retailers selling insects. And in most markets, they're in large dirty bowls on the ground. There's a lot of foot traffic and dust. There's flies everywhere. People have their faces in the insects and you know they're handling them with their bare hands. Entomo Food has really set themselves apart from their competitors just by following basic hygiene and food safety standards and taking the additional step of processing and packaging, um, they've added a lot of value to their products. And, and by doing this, they were able to reach a larger international pool of consumers. But I don't think that insects, insect products necessarily have to be processed and packaged to add value. There are very simple and economical things retailers can do to increase the value of their products. I mean, just putting them in clean bowls off the ground on a table, have them covered with netting to keep the flies off, wear disposable gloves, a hairnet and a mask when transferring insects from bowls to packages for consumers. 
clean and sanitize your area frequently and package them in clean unused bags. So FFO has recently partnered with a local nonprofit in Kinshasa, it's the Women in Business Association. And they're working on opening an insect centric marketplace and restaurant, it's called Makizi Restaurant, and that's Lingala for Caterpillar. And through the, business, the Women in Business Association, we're gonna be able to start providing our farmers with training in business and marketing principles Food safety, food safety and handling, as well as basic hygiene. Because currently palm weevil larvae are, they're one of the more expensive products on the market. Um, as far as protein goes, they're about $20 per keg. And these are the larvae that are sold like this on bowls in the ground. So simple practices can really increase sales and even draw in, draw in a wider range of, of customers, including even possibly those that don't typically eat insects because of the unsanitary conditions. Although insects are a, are a very popular food in Africa, they're not widely farmed. And in recent years, insect farming is being promoted more and more. And I do believe that as farming techniques are developed and adopted, it's possible that less insects will need to be harvested from the wild. So I'm going to move on to farming insects at this point. And I really do think that farming insects can address some of the major challenges that we've encountered with wild harvesting, you know, it's such as the lack of food safety standards, um, the seasonal nature of wild harvesting and the variable harvest, sustainability issues, as well as the hazardous working conditions. And we've seen a lot of the revenue streams in the wild insect sector. These are also relevant to insect farming, but insect farming also provides a variety of additional income generating activities. And farming insects in general really isn't farming them for human food and animal feed really. It, it's being promoted more and more in recent years, but it's, it's really not new. According to the archeological evidence, humans have been keeping bees, for example, for over 9,000 years. So these are some of the species that are farmed and some are actually farmed for several uses. I didn't know this, but cockroaches are farmed for food animal feed as well as for use in cosmetic and pharmaceutical products. And I learned a lot about lac insects while I was putting this presentation together. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the lac industry. It's a scale insect. They secrete a resinous substance called lac that's used in, in a lot of different applications like as a food colorant or even as a wood finish. Um, a fun fact I came across about the lac industry is that the majority of lac farming takes place in India and Thailand, and it provides employment for over 2 million people. So I thought that was pretty cool. Insects can be reared using two main approaches. Um, in a semi-domestic farming approach, insects are partially raised in captivity, and they're not completely separated from their wild counterparts. And this is accomplished by modifying the insect's habitat to increase production. Examples of insects that are semi-domesticated semi include um, palm weevil larvae, the arboreal foliage consuming caterpillars, and also um, harvesting edible eggs of aquatic hemipterans from artificial oviposition sites. That was another new one for me that I learned about. Um, locusts, wasps, bamboo caterpillars, dragonflies, um, these insects also belong to this category. And this isn't a comprehensive list either. These are just a few examples. The other approach is full domestication where the insect carries out its entire life cycle in captivity. And some examples of fully domesticated species are the millworms, cockroaches, crickets, and some beetles. The advantages of farming insects are that it can provide a consistent supply of insects 
and reduce pressure on wild populations. Um, it can be more environmentally sustainable compared to certain wild harvesting techniques. And of course, there's increased food safety with the implementation of production control measures in farming. It allows for the inclusion of vulnerable women and youth. And again, it's a vital component of food security and contributes to household income. And there are multiple revenue generating activities that can come out of insect farming. Although more resources, more resources are needed to farm versus gather insects, it's still pretty minimal. And I'm really referring to um, you know, household farming and small scale farming and not necessarily, obviously not the large industrial scale insect farming that's taking place. There is really an overwhelming lack of knowledge on really basic questions such as what are the most suitable species to farm? What are their housing and feed requirements? How are we gonna manage their waste? And what are humane harvesting techniques? I get that asked question. I get that question all the time. How are they harvested? Um, people are still you know, very concerned about animal rights issues, even when it comes to insects. The high cost of feed is an issue in some farming systems and sourcing feeds that are free of pesticides and mycotoxins can be challenging in certain parts of the world. And in any farming system where there are large numbers of individuals in close proximity, there's always the potential for disease outbreaks. And we saw this in the cricket in industry with the Denso virus. And for a lot of insects that were starting to farm, we're really not gonna know what potential pathogens are lurking until the entire herd is wiped out. But at any rate, there, there needs to be implementation of biosecurity measures, whether we're talking about a household farm or a large industrial scale farm. And, and we do need to identify appropriate therapeutics to treat disease outbreaks as well as um, you know, research their safety and withdrawal times to avoid residues in food products. This is a whole area of research that needs to be addressed. Farming non-native insects is one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, I, I just don't think that's a good idea at all. I think we need to stick with insects that are already native or at least um, present. Um, I, it's just, it's too risky. The introduction of invasive species could really wreak havoc on um, an ecosystem that they're not native to. And then uh, I've, I come back to this again and again, there's a need to raise awareness of the great potential of edible insects amongst policymakers um, to promote and guide future development and channel funding into research. Um, into these key areas. So I'm gonna talk about the nascent palm weevil farming industry in Cameroon and how farming palm weevil larvae is addressing some of the issues around worker safety and sustainable use of resources. The African palm weevil, and this again is the species that Farms for Orphans is farming in Kinshasa, um, they're consumed by a majority of the inhabitants of the Congo Basin. And like I showed you before, they're extremely rich in protein and nutrients. And in addition to food, many people use the larva or oil extracted from the larva for medicinal purposes. I believe they're used to treat rashes and wounds um, as well as coughs and colds. So the collection and sale of palm weevil grubs is again, an important source of either primary or supplemental income for most forest dependent communities in Cameroon, as well as throughout the, the Congo Basin. In 2004, the average monthly income for rural collectors who sell locally was $50. While the average monthly income for rural collectors who sell grubs to retailers supplying urban markets was about $70. In 2015, the figures were much higher with an average monthly income generated, these were by professional grub, grub collectors ranging from 180 
to $600 USD. So income generated through palm weevil trade is, is higher than a lot of the other rural income sources. For example, coffee producers average about $50 per month, and that's in good years. And compared to other non-timber forest products, uh, bushmeat harvesters average $58 per month, and then rattan collectors average $26 per month. Historically, collectors use both traditional harvesting techniques as well as methods of semi-domestication to harvest the grubs. So in the traditional harvesting, um, this is usually carried out by men. It involves collecting grubs from palms that are naturally infested with the weevils, with the grubs. And this met method is sustainable because only the dead infested palm stems are exploited. Um, and there's very little to no investment, but the collectors must spend days, if not weeks in the forest to collect adequate numbers of grubs. And then in the semi-farming system, collectors will go out into the forest and they'll fell large expanses of this raffia habitat because this is the palm weevil's favorite habitat and food source in the wild. And it's the decaying palm tissue that attracts the breeding beetles. And then the females will lay eggs in the palm tissue. And then the collectors will come back several weeks earlier and or later rather, and collect the edible grubs. So this method is more productive than traditional methods. Um, the collectors don't have to spend days in the forest during the harvest, and the grubs are actually sold in a much fresher state since sales are carried out just within a few hours after collection. But the downside is, and this is a biggie, is that this method has really encouraged collectors to clear vast expanses of this sensitive raffia habitat in order to induce weevil infestation. Um, and this obviously is not sustainable. So because of increasing demand for the grubs by urban consumers, the irregular supplies and the unsafe and unsustainable harvesting methods, um, scientists from a nonprofit organization called Living Forest Trust or LIFT developed palm weevil farming methods. And their, their grub farming system involved collecting, coupling and introducing adult palm weevils um, in plastic boxes containing fresh raffia tissue. They started out by training eight farmers in this farming method. Each farmer had three boxes and in each box there were three male female pairs that were introduced. Um, the edible grubs were harvested within 30 days and using less than a quarter of the quantity of raffia as in the semi-farming system, they averaged 69 grubs and up to 73 grubs per box. So in comparison, traditional harvey, harvesting methods average 35 grubs per raffia stem and the semi-farming system averages 50 grubs per raffia stem. So of the farmers that continue to grow their farms, they were able to complement their income with a regular monthly revenue of about $100 to $140 by selling the farmed grubs. Uh, the researchers at Lyft concluded that if, if this farming system is well managed, grubs could be produced to meet market demands and ensure year round regularity of supply. And the number of raffia st stems would, that would be exploited for grub production would be reduced significantly. So we could assure the survival and sustainability of the raffia ecosystem. So the advantages are that farming the grubs can provide a year round supply it prevents massive destruction of raffia ecosystems. It's much, much less labor intensive. So um, more women can be involved in farming the grubs. And it's less risky than either of the traditional methods, um, which include accidents, snake bites, exposure to the elements. The disadvantages are that this system of farming has to be carried out while there, where there's a 
a relatively good supply of raffia palm. And so for more widespread farming of palm weevil, um, cost effective alternative feeds and substrates need to be identified because raffia really isn't easy to come by in areas where it's not growing. And I can um, assure you of that. This is our farm. This is um, a picture of our farm from, from Google Earth. There's a little tiny pin up there in the upper left-hand corner. Sorry, I get my left and my right confused. And you can see we're farming palm weevil grubs in the heart of an African mega city. There, there's, no, there's not a, a source of raffia palm that's readily available. So we've been working on identifying locally available cost-effective palm weevil feeds and appropriate and affordable feeds for farmed insects. It's, this is again, another very, very basic question that there's a huge need for research and funding in this area. So I'd love to hear from the audience if anybody has experience in this area or has suggestions. And um, I'll save that for a discussion point um, so I can get through the rest of my talk here. Insect, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Insect farming has led to new and innovative revenue streams for people. And so I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into some of these. And this is an area that really excites me because I'm always, always looking for ways um, for our farmers to increase their income. And I can't talk about insect farming without talking about Thailand. Um, Thailand is one of the first countries in the world to have developed a viable food insect farming sector. Crickets and palm weevil larvae are the two most widely farmed insects. Um, the majority of cricket farming takes place in the northeast part of the country and palm weevil farming takes place down there in the southern part of the country. Again, this is where they, um, they uh, occur in the wild and this is where there is a good source of feed for the larva. But I'm gonna be talking about cricket farming for this talk um, in Thailand. It began in 1998, so nearly 22 years ago, I think. Um, small scale cricket farming is, is rarely found today and most of these farms are medium or large scale enterprises. And community cooperatives of cricket farmers have been established to disseminate information on farming technology, marketing and business issues. And about 60% of the country's cricket farmers are women. Cricket farming is a main source of income for a majority of farmers. As of 2011, there were an estimated 20,000 insect farms in operation and total production from 1996 to 2011 averaged about 7,500 tons per year. So insect farming contributes to income generation and livelihood opportunities for tens of thousands of Thai people. And this includes insect farmers, um, those involved in processing, transport and marketing of edible insects. So a number of products have emerged from the cricket farming industry. The mature adult crickets for human food are the main product and farmers can sell their crickets to wholesale buyers, retailers or restaurants, directly to consumers in rural and urban markets. And many farmers sell in more than one way. So profits earned by farmers in rural areas ranged from $2.25 to $5.50 per keg and $1.68 to $4.75 for farmers in urban areas. And I think um, a lot of the variance in profits is due to who the farmers are selling to. The net profits for harvesting cycle is about 50% of their gross income for farmers selling directly to wholesale buyers, but farmers can earn more profit if they sell their products directly to retailers, restaurants, or consumers. So because the cricket farming industry is so lucrative, um, there's a demand for cricket eggs and a lot of farmers sell eggs to either 
new farmers getting into the business as well as to just other farmers that want to increase genetic diversity on their farms. It's also resulted in the growth of cricket uh, farming um, feed companies. So this was a, a new market opportunity um, for these feed companies and they started formulating cricket feeds as of 2016. I believe there are five different brands of cricket feed on the market. And then another revenue generating activity by farmers is the collection and sale of insect frass um, or their waste, which can be used as a fertilizer. And this is marketed to gardeners and farmers. And there's also a demand for crickets in for animal feed. And I, I in fact, a lot of farmers produce crickets exclusively for reptile or fish breeders um, that use them for food. So I wanted to present profit data on these activities, but I could not find anything in the literature about it. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. If anybody has a source, please um, pass that along to me. That'd be awesome. So in the West, mainly US and Europe, insects and especially crickets have been farmed for the pet industry for some time now, um, primarily serving reptile, fish and the pocket pet industry. But more recently, production of insects for livestock feed has gained a lot of attention globally. It's believed that insects can provide much of the protein animals need at a much lower environmental cost. In 2018, the, the food, or sorry, the feed insect industry was valued at 442 billion and black soldier flies and mealworms are particularly favored for large scale production for use as a livestock feed. So the West is all over this, but insects farmed for livestock feed could really be a game changer in developing countries because poor quality or inadequate animal nutrition is one of the main, if not the most important livestock productivity limiting constraint faced by small scale producers in the tropics. And farmers in the tropics experience lower productivity because they lack access to affordable, high quality animal feed. So Insectapro is a business that's based in Kenya and they're making high quality insect-based livestock feed with the aim of boosting the aquaculture sector and employment of women in this sector. So for this purpose, they're farming black soldier fly and they've gone from pilot to operating one of the largest commercial BSF facilities in East Africa in just two years. So lots of potential there. Similarly, um, Farms for Orphans was recently invited to participate in research evaluating the efficacy of palm weevil farming byproducts, um, mainly like the, the spent beetles that we have um, and using that as a poultry and fish feed. So this is a developing project and I think it has a lot of potential and could lead to another revenue generating activity for our farmers. So we're really excited about this work with academic partners on, on these types of research questions. This is the last case study. Um, and this is one of the Mopani worm in Southern Africa. And this is really a story of sustainability and innovation. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the Mopani worm, but it, it, it's really not a worm. Um, it's the larval stage of the emperor moth. And this is a species that's distributed throughout Southern Africa. It closely follows, but it's not entirely restricted to the distribution of their preferred host plant, which is the Mopani tree. So the moth lays eggs on leaves and branches of the Mopani tree. And once they're hatched, the caterpillars feed on the leaves of the tree. They go through several different molts. And then it's the last instar, the, the fifth instar that is harvested for consumption. Um, if they're allowed to carry out their life cycle, they'll burrow underground near the base of the tree to pupate. And then this pupal stage lasts about six to seven months. So the caterpillars are seasonally available. Collection takes place twice a year, usually from like December to January, and then again from March to April. The vast majority of collectors are women and children. 
a study of the trade in Zambia reported that 95% of the collectors were poor rural women living within 50 kilometers of the harvesting areas. And then men primarily act as the intermediaries between the harvesters and the markets. And the caterpillars are, they're hand collected from their host tree. In a good year, one collector can harvest up to 50 kegs per day. I thought that was astounding. And then once they're collected, they're degutted, they're boiled for up to an hour, they're salted and then lied out, laid out in the sun to dry. These are um, some fun facts that I came across when I was doing my, my research for this talk. And I think um, these really demonstrate that the Mopani worm is a major source of food and income for many of these communities in Southern Africa. So for example, in Namibia, a 50 keg sack of Mopani worm grosses $70 USD. Um, in Botswana alone, the industry employs an estimated 10,000 people annually. And the cross-border trade between Botswana, South Africa, and Zimbabwe is valued between 27 and 41 million USD annually. So it's again, another pretty lucrative industry and poor regulation and management of Mopani worm resources has really created an enabling environment for unsustainable harvesting. And caterpillar populations are also compromised because the host tree that the worm depends on is cut down and used for other purposes, um, like firewood. It's a pretty strong wood, so it's used as a construction material. It's also used as um, a dry season livestock feed as well as uh, for several different medicinal purposes. And in addition, increased deforestation for agriculture and the increased use of pesticides and environmental pollution are, are, are also threatening populations of the Mopani worm. So given the value of the worms, especially in efforts to reduce poverty and ensure food security, securing the sustainable harvest of Mopani worms is highly significant. And because of issues of overharvesting and Mopani habitat destruction, people are becoming involved more and more in semi-domestication of the Mopani worm. So they can do this by introducing the Mopani worm eggs or young caterpillars to appropriate habitat near their home or on their land. And then when the caterpillars reach maturity, they're collected to eat. And in this system, people can keep an eye on their caterpillars um, and improve the timing of collection, only collecting the fifth instar caterpillars. And then they can leave a percentage of caterpillars to pupate below the trees and the resulting moths will then lay eggs on the tree um, below which they pupate or on nearby trees. Creating and managing Mopani habitat can also be done um, by planting insects, the insects host tree in predetermined areas and this will attract the moths with which lay their eggs on the foliage. And then also applying correct fire regimes to protect the host trees and prevent destruction of, of the eggs and the pupa underground. And then fourth of, of or next actually, um, not cutting down the trees for other purposes. Obviously this is going to preserve the caterpillars breeding sites. And these techniques really stem from indigenous knowledge of caterpillar biology. And it was, again, through my research, I came across this company called Mopani Worm Enterprises and they're based in Zimbabwe. And on their homepage, they state the reasons for starting their business. And they say that Mopani worms are faced um, with threats from over harvesting, global warming, destruction of, of Mopani woodlands. And so at Mopani Worm Enterprises, we've perfected a sustainable way of farming Mopani worms. And we're looking to work with new farmers, informal traders, hotels, restaurants, and governments. And then they also have a list of their products and services. They sell, sell dried Mopani worms. They also sell Mopani worm eggs. Um, the pupa, they sell Mopani tree seedlings and Mopani seeds. 
As far as services, they offer Mopani worm farming courses. Um, and they said on their website that these farming courses will prepare farmers to grow Mopani worms for human food and livestock feed. Um, they'll help you run your own retail shop, produce Mopani worm pupa, and then incorporate agritourism into your activities. And they also say that um, Mopani worm farming is more profitable than cattle ranching, tobacco farming, or chicken farming. And then they offer consulting services on Mopani worm farming. Um, they work with governments and private landowners to create Mopani habitat. And then they offer agritourism on their farm. So they're doing some really cool innovative things like selling the insect eggs and selling the host plants. But what really caught my eye was the Mopani farm agritourism. And agritourism is, it's a commercial enterprise at a working farm and it's conducted for the enjoyment of visitors that generate supplemental income for the farmer. So at Mopani Worm Enterprises, they offer bird viewing and um, education in Mopani testing. So I thought this was brilliant. I don't know if you know any birders, but birders are crazy. They will travel the world to catch a glimpse of a bird on their life list. And I know about these things because I'm married to one and this is actually our daughter a few years ago on a trip to Costa Rica. We always have to spend a day or two birding. Um, and then I did a quick search on the avian species associated with Mopani habitat and found this paper. And you know the authors just reported on different bird predators of the Mopani instars and there are it's a lot of different unique species um, that feed on, on the insects or yeah, sorry, on the caterpillars. Um, so, you know, obviously their farm is gonna have to be managed for both um, food production as well as wildlife viewing. But, you know, we manage habitats all the time for all kinds of different uses. And I, I think it can be done. So this is the final opportunity that I'm going to discuss. I'm gonna be wrapping it up here. Um, and that is insect cuisine. So Farms for Orphans was recently approached by the Wildlife Conservation Society in the Congo. And they invited us to participate in an initiative to promote insects as a healthy alternative to bush meat. So as a part of this, we're working with a chef who commonly cooks with insects to prepare cooking videos um, for the public. And of course, my first thought was, oh my gosh, cooking with insects. There is another career opportunity and income generating activity in the edible insect sector for which we can provide training. And insects, they have a wide variety of tastes and textures and they can be prepared in many different ways. They're fried, they're baked, they're barbecued. And you know, this isn't an opportunity that should be confined to Africa. Um, every year, huge, huge quantities of bush meat are imported into Europe and the US, in the US from West and Central Africa um, for the African diaspora. And bush meat is sold for top of the, you know, top of the range prices. And I read a paper about the bush meat trade, and the authors reported that consumption of bush meat is really culturally driven by a desire. Um, for these people to remain connected to their country of origin. But why couldn't insects fill that need? And anytime, you know, we're, we talk about insects in the media, there's always this picture of somebody getting ready to shove this big leggy bug, you know, with the eyeballs staring at you and antenna everywhere. And this really isn't helping us. Um, you know, it's, it's not helping portray insects in a positive light or as a delicious protein, but you know, showing beautiful presentations of insects can really do a lot to make insects an acceptable food to the larger masses. So um, tying back to the earlier part of my presentation, basic hygiene and presentation will really do a lot to elevate edible insects. 
Um, in this picture I have on the left, this is the typical presentation. Um, these are crickets sold as a street food in, in Kinshasa. And then on the right is an insect dish that's served at an upscale restaurant in Kinshasa. It's beautifully plated by chefs. So each of these are gonna to appeal to a different clientele and the income generated of course is going to differ. But regardless of how you eat insects, if you're ever eating insects in the Congo, you must consume them with Tembo, which is the local um, beer. Okay, so I've given you an overview of the whole revenue generating landscape as well as presented challenges we need to address. And I hope that you can appreciate that there is so much potential in this industry for generating food and income, whether for small scale farmers in Africa or large scale production of insects as an animal feed in Australia, like we heard about yesterday. Um, Dorcas was in the first cohort of insect farmers that we trained, and we have learned so much since training this initial group of youth. Um, last year with COVID, we really had to take a step back, and this gave us an opportunity to, um, to further develop our programs, and we're going to be training um, we're incorporating more trainings um, in green livelihood opportunities within the edible insect sector um, for our youth farmers. And, you know, we work with so many smart, motivated, entrepreneurial minded women and youth, but they historically have had very little support in terms of training or access to funding. And we're really working to change this. I believe that entrepreneurial activities are going to create employment. It breeds innovation, it promotes economic growth, and insect farming can provide a means for people to earn a living wage safely and with dignity. And, and when people can make a living wage, families are fed and people live more productive lives. So my final question to you is, where do you see yourself getting involved? And I hope that this has really inspired you and given you some ideas of all the different possibilities that there are in this sector. Um, I am more than happy to continue the conversation. Um, shoot me an email and we can Zoom or um, shoot me a WhatsApp and let's talk. That's all I have for you guys tonight. I hope I didn't go over too much. I apologize if I did. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Amy Franklin. Uh, it's worthless for my side. And it's, uh, I salute and I appreciated your wide vision and your broad minded and your activeness. I'm really, really uh, means, uh, uh, means worthless, fitless <laughs> from my side. And I'm very, very excited and happy to have you uh, in these workshop. And I'm thankful to you for accepting when, uh, my proposal and our proposal to be with us. Uh, you have uh, highlighted in details regarding the this and all the um, opportunities and livelihood security regarding the rearing of uh, insects, particularly palm weevils and uh, mopine worms. So uh, it's very, very interesting. It's eye-opening, I think, I hope. Every participant must be uh, this one enjoying your lecture. And uh, uh, and one more, uh, well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> one more, ma'am, uh, I want to Thank take you so much. Much time. Uh, I want to take some few time from you. I just want to uh, uh, take the privilege of your present and uh, to, I wanted to show you some of uh, my, uh, this one, people in my lectures uh, in your presence. If you permit me, uh, uh, I'll be happy to show you my work, if you permit me. I would love to, that'd be great. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Means I don't want to miss this privilege. Uh, uh, so before going further, uh, participant, if you have any uh, questions, you can ask. 
uh, directly to Amit Franklin. And I would like to uh, give the privilege of uh, directly, uh, you know, unmute yourself. Just for a while now, you can unmute and you can ask the questions directly. So if you have any specific question. Any participant? Dear participant? Yeah, just or you can type it in the chat box yeah. as well. Dear participant, any 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 questions or any anything you want to know from madam? From dear participant? Yeah. Hello, you guys are always yeah. welcome to send me an email um, yeah. after the lecture. So uh, that's not a problem. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Yeah, it's Hello. audible. Continue. Yeah, yeah ma'am. Uh, ma <clears throat> is there any particular website uh, from where we can have the information regarding the farming of insects worldwide? Any particular website? Um, you yeah. mean as far as how to farm? No, 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 ma'am. Is there any particular website, website where the information regarding the rearing of insects is there? A particular website or something, information, information platform? I'm, I'm sorry, are you, are you talking about uh, with like instructions on how yeah, to yeah, farm yeah. insects? Yeah, yeah, instructions and information. So um, what's species where are you interested in farming and, uh, yeah, like, uh, because that, I know there's, yeah, there's that, information that, for cricket yeah, farming out there um, through soldier, like, FAO's website yeah, black soldier fly like like that that is there any okay. common platform yeah now I'm asking is there any common platform or website that contains for black soldier Fly, not that I know of, but I have colleagues um, here in the States that are involved in it, and I could send you their information for yeah. you to get in touch with them. So if you want to put your email in the chat, yeah, um, yeah, I can yeah. follow up with you that way. Okay. Uh, I can end up here. Uh I can add up here uh, regarding uh, Mick Tornet. He uh, yesterday he also presented. He is also um, working and initiated that uh, black soldier fry, and particularly in India. So Dr. Alman Das is trying to uh, initiate that breeding of these uh, black soldier fry, and uh, so you can have a contact to them also and. Uh, there are uh, some bodies are there, not specific for the this one black soldier fly, but for the specifically for the this one insect uh, like in, uh, those who are working in the insect. There are uh, so some associations are there. Uh, I'll let you see. Uh, I'll share you in future. Okay. Uh, any other question? Any other question? Any participant? Uh, if uh, there is no more question, I don't want to waste the time of Madam Amy Franklin because it is midnight here. So I just wanted to take the hard privilege uh, uh, to present some of little bit some of my work. So I went over to our colleague Dr. P. Raja to uh, continue. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amy Franklin. Indeed, we are uh, glad to uh, you know. Um, see your work, how they are doing it and how you are, uh, you know, uh, bringing this, your information and technology even to the um, unreached countries like uh, Africa. And I was listening to your talk from the beginning to the end. It was very nice. And uh, so I hope we'll continue to have, uh, get a lot of information from you in your future. Thank you so much. Now I'll introduce uh, uh, Dr. T. Sandibala, Madam. Uh, she's an associate professor in agricultural entomology here, and uh, she will be delivering uh, this uh, 10 to 15 minutes, what she is doing uh, here in, um, uh, what she is doing in, in our college. Uh, she served as a various capacity since 1999, and she worked on the Insect Pest Association with various vegetable crops. 
she reported a peapod borer as well as uh, uh, you know a pest complex of p different uh, potential coccinellidae as a bio control agent as well as a bio efficacy of various botanicals uh, in 2008 she got a scientist position in institute of uh, bio resources and uh, sustainable development and served for 11 years and thereafter she explored and documented for more than 80 different insect bio resources and did uh, nutritional profiling of several species. She identified casual organism of uh, tiger band disease of oak tassar, silkworm, and uh, as uh, anthrae, uh, proily, uh, alpha, alpha baclovirus, and the DPT uh, overseas associate at the University of uh, Notre Dame, uh, Indiana, USA. Uh, she stayed there and worked there in 2016 to 17 in USA and explored different uh, species of wild serigenous uh, insects, among which two species, uh, Rhododina, uh, Nivare, and uh, Anthere. And also, she has published more than 38 uh, research papers in various international and national peer reviewed journals. And also, she worked uh, in, uh, she attended. Uh, uh, 15th International Congress of Entomology, Oriland, Florida, USA. And she's also a recipient of various awards. Now, I request Madam to uh, brief about her work, what she's doing here. Madam, please, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Emmy Franklin, for uh, giving me time. And uh, oh, at one side, I'm sorry, I'm taking your rest time, uh, but I don't want to miss these opportunities to interact with you. So without wasting my time, I, just, uh, I would like to uh, share my, some of my work. So as a part of these three workshop, uh, as a part of this workshop that uh, that we organize that is specifically on the topic that edible insect and non-conventional food as a nutrient pack and the livelihood security and under that uh, third theme. So uh, uh, I'm presenting, but morely I'll be uh, covered off all those uh, three themes also. So specifically, I'm concentrating to the potentials of edible insect in the particularly in the Northeast India. So here, Northeast India lies in the uh, this one transitional zone of India that is uh, Indo-Burma, uh, Malaysian, and the Indo-Chinese region. So here, uh, it's uh, uh, occupied in the Indo Mega Biodiversity Hotspot. And uh, this one, the reasons occupied more than 50 uh, uh, percent of the flora means we said endemic to the reason. So that is why it is a biodiversity hotspot reason. So specifically in the Northeast region, Northeast India, more than 100 ethnic groups are inhabited. So since time immemorial, these ethnic groups were utilizing insect as a valuable resources, like uh, in different for the welfare of the human being in different fields, like the use of the seal and lake, uh, honey and natural dye, as well as food item, and not only as the edible, they are also used in the traditional medicinal practices. And uh, so despite having these various diversities of uh, this one, uh, resources to use in a different field, but uh, attention uh, with reference to the uh, entomophagy concern is still lacking behind and still uh, not given uh, much recognized. So that is why we, uh, the, in this region, uh, it is the right time to explore the insect resources utilization. So uh, I did not need not to brief about this scenario, but uh, let me uh, this one summarize that uh, about 80% of all populations 
believe it or not, that it is uh, considered that insects a regular diet. And I think I believe on it because Southeast Asian country, like uh, uh, specifically China, they are the world more populated, and another part of their their main diet is a uh, uh, this one insect is uh, uh, considered as their main diet. So it is a fact. And insect also give high energy conversation index, and it is also a good source of protein. We all know that one. And uh, the plus point is that availability of the easily available biomass. So here, I uh, every uh, this one speaker share the whole scenario regarding edible insect. Particularly, uh, I am sharing these with reference to the India. So here, the whole portions of the India is uh, green in color. That means uh, darker green in color. That means that the insect species uh, available as edible insect is range from 100 to 200. So where these uh, exactly uh, is it correct or not? But when we consider the the India, it is specifically restricted to the northeastern India. So the red color here, uh, uh, these portion of the India, it is the northeastern region. And the other part means the Jharkhand, the, some uh, the in Bihar, this red part is also consumed some insect. And the coastal areas, the uh, Kerala and other here, these red portions, these are the only regions where edible insects are consumed. And particularly in the Northeastern India, all the eight states are consuming the edible insect. And the photograph here I'm showing here, these are my own uh, collection. And these are the some of the photographs, uh, some of the species that consume here. And this is the farm weevil that ma'am, you have already shown here in this region also, it is consumed. And this is a grasshopper, uh, which is gone with the herbs, with coriander and others, uh, and it is sold in the local matter. And uh, uh, this is one of the publications. I've started this work uh, in, from the 2008, and in the beginning of the 2008, when I started, as initially I was working on the insect assessment in a different field, but it is a new venture for me, they joined as a scientist in the Institute of Virus and, and Sustainable Development that uh, uh, the DBT is especially uh, man focuses to work on the uh, natural resources. So in that, insect is also one of the part and I have uh, to work on the utilization of the insect. Uh, I have to see my sub, uh, means my um, presentation from the assessment to the utilization of the insect when we use for, uh, when we talk about the assessment of insect any 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 okay so um, and it is a difficult part for me to uh, see from the pair to the usefulness I review one article with a student. Uh, so in the year 2010, and here I have the importance of the resources, and we need to think on uh, on pay. Okay, it's here. Yeah. Okay. So, in in the activity,
Yeah. So in the non region, particular uh, system, uh, state where we are staying, our attractor in our children. Here for the last uh, okay. So in the Manipur, uh, more than thirty-three ethnic peoples are inhabited. So these ethnic, all the ethnic peoples were consuming uh, the insect species. But this ethnic, uh, very there are there is a variation of the number of the insect species that consumes. Uh, by them. So uh, uh, this favorability of the insects vary from one uh, uh, ethnic uh, to another ethnic. Uh, so on the basis of the utilization of resources in the region, divide this insect resources into six categories. The first one is edible, the uh, other one is the insect that used for Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> there was an internet, uh, this, this one. Uh, so, uh, and the fifth one is the insect that used uh, for the cultural means uh, related to the culture. And the last one is insect specific. It's not moving. I'm disconnecting now. You can speak now from here. Yeah. Just for a minute, can I get through another computer? Sorry for the interruption.
Is this legible to you? Is this like visible? Okay. So I told you this uh, different ethnic peoples, the numbers. From 25 to 30 in the space where so in the the and the most preferred insects are followed by these beetles and then uh, that. Uh, that is the grasshopper that is of the hala. It is also com uh, comes under mosses. This is also come. There was a lot of service internet connectivity. So maximum of the uh, insect resources, 70, above 70% is utilized as a able purposes and not by 36, more than 36 percent followed by the medicinal purposes. And uh, instead of you are in four, the four different form like as a by uh, 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 in the form of uh, fried, Uh, coming to first scenario, use of in source man can follow cattle when sitting to these scenarios of the and then and groups. So From here. So, 
Ah, a lot of disturbances here. Speak. From here, speak. Okay, so here I'm sharing the photographs of the, some of the edible uh, species. So I'll directly go to the, is it visible? Mm. No, it will be visible. It will be visible. No, 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 no. Bad luck for me, a lot of disturbances there. And these are the, some of the this one pictures of the edible insect. And uh, these are also different insect species. Okay. Because I'm worried, a lot of internet disconnection is there. I'm worried. So these are the uh, insects, edible insects that collected from the uh, that collect from uh, 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 Oh, here I'm just a little Another network. Okay. Uh, now you can go. Uh, it's not going again. It's mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, mm -hmm. yeah. it's going. Yeah. Okay. So I'll quickly pass on. So this is also I'll pass on. Uh, so uh, so more than 20 insect species were used for the medicinal purposes by the traditional peoples and in treating the different. 13 categories and the diseases uh, and many diseases. So we 
believe, uh, we don't need to believe whatever these traditions were using in the medicinal purposes for that we need the scientific validations, whether what they're claiming is correct or not. So that's where signs are needed. And uh, one of my publication is uh, that we have, we have uh, 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 we have published one database which is specifically uh, for the uh, listing of the edible insect and the medicinal insects of Manipur. And these are some of the uh, uh, photograph how the traders, uh, peoples were collecting from the natures and they could identify where these insect species are lying and uh, they, uh, they uh, uh, were collecting from the natures. And so uh, by analyzing all the eight, more than 80 species of insect resources, now we uh, come to the prioritizations on the basis of the uh, their favorability and the availability and the feasibility. So we have selected and two uh, this one uh, group, one under the hymenopteran, and specifically the giant water bug here, the giant water bug, this one particularly, this species for one, spe uh, it is very highly priced and the prices ranges from these, uh, in the Indian currency, it is ranges from the 30 to the 50 par seasons. That means when we convert it to the US dollar, one, uh, uh, edible insect, one giant water bug is uh, costing about the point, uh, point mm -hmm. eight five, no more than point five, point eight or something like the dollar. And the other one is the sericescence, that is the silkworm. So here, the uh, the northeastern region is considered as the sericescence. Uh, reasons for the uh, silkworm. So, and here, not only the for four commercially exploited species are available here, uh, all the, the this different wild species means out of the 50, more than 50 species available in the world for the wild sedicious insect in the northeastern region, however, more than the 25 species, I mean 50% of the wild sericescence insects are available. So this reason is considered as a reason for the origins of the sericescence insect. All the um, this pupa and the larvae of the sericescence uh, the insects are comes under the edible insects. So why do we go for these edible insects and how, in which form we can go? So when we talk about the, uh, when we see about the market scenario regarding protein sources, so in the market, the soybean protein is available, hay protein is available and freeze protein is available. Why not for the insect protein? Because uh, traditionally from the immemorial time, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, these, edible, uh, these insects are a part of our diet it has been consuming from since time immemorial. So uh, like the other uh, product, like the uh, protein, so why can't we develop the insect protein? This is our uh, 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 function. And uh, uh, not only for the human consumption, it can also be thing for the uh, uh, animal feed. Here in the region, the feed is a uh, problem for rearing these fees when we talk about the fees and when we talk about the poultry also. And as I've already told you, we have the privilege and the advantage of having the uh, all the commercially exploited species silkworm. And in the silkworm, uh, in the sericulture, Bender, the pupa is the uh, considered as a waste, and seventy percent of these uh, sericulture input goes as a waste in terms of pupa. So why can't we use this pupa? And this pupa at one side is it uh, edible. So and in some part of the uh, northeastern region, when we are this particularly for these iri silkworm, they are not made rare for these silk production. Specifically, they rear for the consumption purpose. So, and one side, 70 persons are coming as a waste in form of the pupa. So, uh, that is why I think to take enough to utilize this waste pupa. So, we already initiated uh, this utilization of this silicon pupa. First, we uh, uh, this. Um, uh, convert it into the uh, protein powder means by removing the fat content on it. So uh, and this fat content, so initially not for human consumption or uh, not for uh, directly for human consumption, it can be used for the uh, in some other value addition form. Like first we have tried for the formations of the fish feed. 
So uh, here uh, I'm showing these three different uh, uh, pupa protein uh, concentrate powder. The color here, the variations of the color is uh, dependent on the uh, solvent that we use. So when we use this solvent, this one, uh, uh, ethanol, so it is giving uh, odorless, colorless. And when we extract it for using the head, so color still retained and some uh, smell is also retained. So uh, <clears throat> for this, making this powder, we uh, contacted to the local entrepreneur because for them it is a waste, it is a burden for them because for producing the good quality of the uh, silk yarn, they have to uh, boil and they have to do the processing of the yarn production within three, four days. Otherwise, uh, the pupa will uh, immerse in the other form that uh, that gives the uh, from the uh, uh, pierce cocoon the bad quality of the silk yarn is produced. So that is why within the sort they have to uh, do all whatever they are harvesting for producing the good quality and for generating good income. They have to produce the uh, real yarn that is the best of yarn. So uh, they have to do it very quickly. So within two, three days. So these are the ways for them. If they are not utilizing, if they are not budding properly, so it is, uh, it give a rotten smell and it's a, um, a problem for them. So we contacted them and we have collected all these, um, uh, all these waste people for them. And it is a, it is a gold mine for us. For them, it is a waste and for us, it is a gold mine. So we remove and we clean it and we dry it in the oven and uh, we make the pupa, uh, that is the concentrated pupa protein powder. So this uh, I have uh, published in uh, my pep uh, in the book chapters. So like here, I'm showing that uh, when we use the extractions of the ethanol, it's give uh, green color and the uh, uh, texture is also granulars and odorless. And this one is prefer uh, more. And when we start the also uh, this uh, uh, regarding the pupa uh, protein concentrate and more than 50 percent digestibility was uh, given when we use the pepsin and the trypsin so this is one of my publications and here i'm sharing that uh, so what is the variation difference in the nutrient content if we use the Spain and and Spain pupa I means Spain means uh, after uh, taking up
ियम so uh, through different approaches we have started our research activity so i just want to conclude that yes this venom have the uh, properties uh, so uh, we need to uh, do the little uh, scientific validation and it is undergoing so i just want to share uh, this is the salivary that is a venom gland that was extracted and different part so we have done protomic approaches and also so i'm not going to detail so i just wanted to so in the last part yes it have these properties so say so there uh, we have uh chickens uh small cap type are having uh, uh different property as a this one anti cancer anti microbials and also still we are undergoing and still needs to be uh, uh do a research study a lot so and this is some of the publications uh okay in between lot of internet disruption is there is it audible am i audible yeah. to you all so if any question so i don't know whether it is audible or not what is it let me see in the chat box is there any there's a response uh, i cannot see this like uh on post uh okay any questions uh in between lot of internet disruptions is there sorry for that uh i just wanted to share some of my research act some of my work to uh dr emily franklin that's why i tag this privilege so anybody any participant yeah dr emily franklin are you there Dr. Emmy Franklin, are you there? She's there. She's there. Yep, I'm here. Okay. Thank you. I unfortunately missed a lot um, because of the internet and everything. So perhaps you and I can um, can Zoom just you and I in the future, and um, you could present it again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which 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 part? I have a lot of disturbance. Internet connection was there, so sorry for that. I don't know what happened. Okay. Uh, but then, uh, please repeat. Please repeat. Doctor M. Franklin, please repeat your questions. Sorry. Oh. Uh, I didn't hear what you said. Please repeat again. Oh, I just said I. Uh, I did not hear um, a lot of oh. the talk because of the internet. So I think yeah. if you agree, you could um, <coughs> you and I could um, have a Zoom talk together, and you could um, present it then. because i definitely, i feel definitely. like i missed so much of it yeah 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 definitely definitely sorry for the yes definitely will connect so in future we'll keep on communication uh, keep on communicating so yeah yes definitely. definitely we need we will stay in touch yes definitely definitely ma'am thank you thank you <laughs> and <laughs> thank you so yeah, much so, Yeah thank you it thank was so you nice to meet you
Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And any other, I think no more, if there is no more question than uh, Raja sir, we can uh, wind up, we can close. And so we can uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. So just for family, I hand over to you to say the board of things. I already have presented, so we can wind up our stations right at the moment. Yeah, yeah. 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 thank you, Dr. Ami Franklin. In spite of your busy schedule, you have accepted our invitation and delivered a talk. And we have learned a lot of things from you. Hope in your future, we will keep in touch. And I would like to thank all the participants for joining with us. And we'll hope we'll meet in the second session by oh, one. Okay, you, oh, Mass presented that last one. So uh, with this, we are winding up our three days uh, of web workshop from insect training on edible insect. So uh, on this occasion, I would like to thank our, our university authority, um, our director of instruction, mm -hmm. Dr. Yes Basanda Singh, for allowing us. Uh, to conduct this uh, uh, webinar through online. And thank you so much, sir, for your kind support. And uh, I would like to thank our deputy DI for his constant encouragement. And uh, he was also joining with us uh, continually and interacting with all the resource person. And also I would like to thank uh, our Dean, Dr. Bian Hasarika uh, for his uh, for, uh, for constant support as well as guiding us uh, to conduct this three days webinar. And uh, lastly, um, I would like to thank our organizing secretary, uh, Dr. Uh, T. Sandibala uh, for organizing such a wonderful online webinar on edible insects. It's a great hour you have created uh, awareness and also it is a, uh, it's a lot of a scope is there in the Northeast. So, people will aware of all this. Thank you, Madam, for organizing such a wonderful program. And uh, I want to profusely thank all the speakers of our three days uh, webinar, um, Professor Arnold Von Huys and Dr. Ravi K. Prapal, and then Mike Thornet, and uh, Dr. Amlen Das, and uh, Dr. Ami Franklin. Thank you so much for all the resource person you have taken interest and you have shown uh, this uh, new uh, venture or uh, created awareness and educated us what is the importance of uh, uh, nutrition value as well as uh, important aspects of rearing these edible sex. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you, participants, for joining us for all these three days. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, one more Gisman, I want to announce that. Uh, please share your feedback. It is already <clears throat> uh, sent to your this one form. is already sent to your email, and we will be keeping an opening till 10 a.m. Uh, so please share with us your feedback and whether you benefited from these workshops or not. And so already I have presented my uh, work. So it will be a repetition if we on in the evening uh, this one afternoon time. So their participant. So now we here come the end of this uh, workshop. So we'll wind up here if any query and I'll be happy if you uh, directly mail me or any help from my side, I'll uh, freely uh, this one uh, extend my help in every field in this, whatever you want to know, I'll share with you from my side. Uh, any other uh, comment if uh, among the participant, if you want to share, share as well. Any participant? Any participant? If you want to, okay. If thank you so much. Uh -huh. Now we will end the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.